So the next speaker for today's session is Mr. Shacha Van Dweck. He is a project manager and consultant at FIER Automotive and Mobility. Uh, xin uh, giới thiệu uh, diễn giả tiếp theo của buổi họp ngày hôm nay đấy là ông San Chavan de Witt. Ông San Chavan de Witt là một uh, là giám đốc quản lý dự án và chuyên gia tư vấn của công ty Fear. Với uh, ông uh, Van, ông San Chavan de Witt thì có kinh nghiệm rất là nhiều năm trong cái lĩnh vực uh, làm các cái dự án quốc tế cũng như dự án trong quốc gia uh, tập trung vào cái việc là Um, giao thông bằng xe điện cũng như là sự khác biệt trong các cái chính sách hỗ trợ cho các uh, phương tiện giao thông sử dụng uh, nhiên liệu sạch trong các quốc gia. Ở trong buổi học ngày hôm nay thì ông Sandra Van de Witt sẽ trình bày bài giảng về hạ tầng sạc điện, các tiêu chuẩn kỹ thuật, hướng dẫn quy hoạch mạng lưới và quản lý lưới điện. Now I would like to welcome Mr. Sandra Van de Witt. Uh, he will presenting the charging infrastructure, charging station, technical standard, and guide the network planning at electricity grid management. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can see. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, indeed, I'm going to tell you something about charging infrastructure and then especially about the standards and the guidance of the network planning. And let me go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is the agenda. Um, I hope everything is readable for everyone. Uh, so it's in English and it's in Vietnamese. Thank you for the translation as well. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the importance of the EV infrastructure. Um, that might be obvious to some, but I want to reiterate that a little bit. And then about the different typologies of infrastructure, uh, something about the technical specifications and interoperability, some city planning, uh, actually a lot of city planning, uh, I have to talk about that, uh, and about the innovation and trends. So first, the importance of EV infrastructure. So why is the EV infrastructure, recharging infrastructure, is it important? Well, simply said, uh, without recharging infrastructure, you don't have any sustainable mobility. There's no business case for this. Simply said, you need to get the vehicle moving. And to get the vehicle moving, you need to have su sufficiently available recharging stations uh, with sufficient power available per charging station. That's needed um, uh, in an abundance, actually, to have satisfied customers. And that's what you do it for. Uh, if you don't have satisfied customers, if they don't see it as reliable, if they don't see it as user-friendly, they won't use the EVs that you uh, that are on the market and then you don't have any sustainable mobility. So that's why it's always a chicken and egg uh, problem. But if you don't have recharging infrastructure, you don't get any EVs on the market. So you need to have the EV driver happy. So you need to take away its concerns. Uh, and on the right-hand side here, you can see uh, research by uh, McKinsey in 2016 and 2019 uh, about the concerns of EV drivers. <clears throat> Sorry. And you can see that um, battery and charging, it was in 2016 uh, the lowest concern actually for EV drivers, but in 2019 it was the biggest concern. So you see that all the other concerns are going away a little bit. So vehicle availability um, and the uh, car experience, the, those are concerns that are going away. People have faith in the EVs, but they don't have faith in battery or recharging, at least not yet. So it's really important to tackle this issue um, uh, head on. So we did research about this uh, quite a lot and there are four main KPIs uh, that are important for the recharging infrastructure. First is, uh, I already mentioned this, sufficient coverage. So you need to have um, sufficiently available recharging infrastructure. If you drive down a highway and you have uh, to drive 200 kilometers uh, for a fast charger while your capacity is only 100 kilometers, that's not sufficient. Uh, it will also drive people away from EV because it's too difficult. Same thing with seamless charging. Seamless charging means that you can cross borders uh, and cross cities actually um, and pay with the same app, with the same card, um, same payment method uh, to make it easy again, seamless for the user. Then payment itself, it needs to be transparent. 
uh, the cost needs to be transparent and it's it's sort of an open door maybe uh, but a lot of times actually certainly in the beginning um, there are different charging stations where you don't know what you're going to pay so you only know in hindsight it's of course um, yeah not sufficiently uh, so not sufficiently transparent for an EV user and fourth is uh, the facility so recharging obviously takes longer than filling up a gas tank so there needs some need to be some facilities available then about the different typologies of recharging. Uh, and this, uh, this image of uh, different icons shows there are a lot of different places in which you can recharge. And I think uh, I couldn't understand the last presentation, but I saw the images. I think that was explained there as well. So you have recharging at work, you have recharging on a highway, at home, at a shopping mall, cinema, theater, um, also in shared, um, shared living quarters. There are different types of recharging, so you need to keep that in mind. It's not just one sort. And besides that, there are different sorts of recharging infrastructure. There are also different sort of vehicles using this infrastructure. Uh, and obviously, not all vehicles can use the same infrastructure. So you have cabs, you have uh, trucks, you have buses, school buses, uh, but also delivery. You have delivery vans. You have light commercial vehicles, um, two wheelers, of course. And all these different vehicles need different. Uh, infrastructure, uh, but you can also combine these, but it's just the fact that uh, a truck uh, will need a much higher higher voltage and higher power than uh, an electric uh, two-wheeler. And this is combined in this slide, actually. Um, yeah, this, these are images, so they're not translated, but it shows different charging profiles. Uh, and every different charging profile serves a different customer or different user. Uh, so at the top left corner, you have charging at home. Uh, this serves, for instance, uh, and it's only an example, a commuter that, that, that only drives a couple of tens of a couple of ten kilometers uh, a day um, as a sufficient charge to go back again and charge at home. There might be some people commuting, um, but they don't have the availability to charge at home, so they need to have public charging. Uh, and then you have, of course, vans, utility vans that drive a lot and need uh, rapid charging during the day to complete their day. Point is, you have all these different type of, types of charging and all these different types serve a different customer. And there are choices to be made here. So it is uh, public charging, as you see, it's a public private charging in public areas, but also a lot of charging is done on private property. So at offices, um, uh, at recreational, but private recreational areas or at homes, um, and choices can be made which customers to serve. Then about the technical specifications and interoperability. Uh, I actually saw this image in the previous slide, but I think it was skipped over. So let me briefly address this. It is important to have, uh, to set standards. Uh, and as you can see, um, all around the world, standards are set, but also large areas where no standard is set. And uh, if you don't set any standards, you can have different plugs. Uh, and that's of course very difficult because then you have to build, uh, yeah, there are four different standards, Roughly, uh, then you have to build four, five, four times as many recharging infrastructure, uh, charging stations to uh, to serve everybody. Um, yeah, I don't won't, won't go in too deep, but uh, the EU, the CCS2, and the CCS1 in North America are the most widespread. And then you have in China the GB2, the GBT, and the Shademo in uh, in Japan. Um, and here I want to show you that that there are different solutions also for different vehicle types. So I explained this already a little bit um, with the different icons so the different vehicles need different, uh, different solutions, but also the future solutions can be different per vehicle. Uh, so you see uh, with the, the Renault there, the Renault Zoe in the image on the top right corner with induction charging. So you drive over a road and there's wireless charging to your battery um, that only works uh, assumingly uh, with big person vehicles. Um, private vehicles, lower battery sizes that probably won't work for what you see on the left-hand side for heavy duty, uh, duty trucks. Um, but it means also there are gonna be different standards for these different types of charging. And here I want to take you to one scenario, one example, and it's only one example because this, this, every vehicle has its own examples, uh, but it's for an e-bus. So here into three different scenarios. The first one is standard charging overnight. So that's uh, low power, well, relatively low power, because 10 to 50 kilowatts is, uh, is high power for some vehicles. But for bus with a high capacity of battery, it needs that kind of power for to charge full overnight. Uh, the first 
scenario, you don't have any fast charging along the route. So you need a very big battery to drive, let's say three routes a day, a bus drives three routes a day. Uh, it needs a very big battery. That's gonna cost a lot of money because batteries are expensive and they're heavy. So you can see you need upwards uh, up to 450 kilowatt hours in battery. And that's gonna weigh four and a half thousand kilograms. So that's a lot. And also, uh, makes it you can take less passengers because you have need all this room and this weight for the, for the batteries. Second option is opportunity charging at the final stops. So you have three routes, let's say you have three routes and you have opportunity charging, so fast charging after every route. So let's say three times a day, it means that your battery capacity goes down to 150 kilowatt hours. That's a big difference also in weight. It does mean, however, that you need to install fast charging stations which are also really expensive. And you have other things to worry about, like grid connections. Uh, but then again, you can take more passengers. And the third option is uh, opportunity fast charging also at intermediate stops. So even more often fast charging. Means that again, your battery capacity can go down. Also the weight of the battery can go down, but you have to install more fast chargers. So the cost gets placed and, uh, elsewhere. Um, an important factor here as well is the, the, the battery life. So if you have more fast charging, Battery life goes down somewhat uh, compared to standard charging overnight. Um, there's not to say that there is one option better than the others. It's really specific to every situation. But this is just to give you an example of the opportunities that there are. And here I want to show you the, the overall EV charging market or the recharging market. So it's really important to have open standard protocols. Uh, as you can see, the EV user uh, needs to connect to the recharging station. Um, while connecting, there needs to be communication between the car or the uh, moped or the trike or the bus with the rechar uh, recharging station. There needs to be communication. If there's no um, same protocol on there, then the communication will work and you can't charge. Um, and this holds for every chain, every link in the chain. So it's important to have these open standards, uh, mainly because um, if you don't have open standards, you can have a proprietary system. With a proprietary system, you can have competition logout and customer login. So I'll explain what that is. If you have a competition logout, let's say the charging point operator um, will get a monopoly because only his protocol is being used and the other ones don't have that protocol. Meaning that the other companies, charging point operators, cannot join in the market. If they cannot join in the market, there won't be any competition with a monopoly and the prices will rise. So this is bad for also for innovation, but also for the EV user because prices go up. Uh, and then he has a competition uh, because there's competition lockout. It can also be a customer login. When a customer has a vehicle by uh, manufacturer X uh, and that only works with that charger of, of the manufacturer. So he cannot go any, anywhere else and there's basically the same situation of a monopoly again. Um, it's easier said than done, of course, to get the open market and the open protocols all working. Because as you can see, this is an example from, uh, from Europe, there is a lot of different players in the market. There is some uh, vertical integration, well, this image is horizontal, but uh, it, all these different partners need to be aligned. And through this standardization, which can be set, of course, also by governments, uh, you enable interoperability and also competition. Um, it's not to say that if you have um, interoperability that uh, in practice or in uh, technical terms, it will be working in practice as well. This is an example, um, and that's, that's still true today in, uh, in Europe. Uh, you need a lot of different apps and a lot of different parts to be sure that you can pay at certain recharging points. Um, I've experienced this myself actually uh, over the summer when, uh, when driving around in Europe somewhat. Um, there are a lot, lot of different recharging points where you need to download a new app, you need to sign in, sometimes even give a, a, a photo of your passport or something, and what if you didn't have it on you, um, to just recharge. And uh, of course, it needs to be easy um, and it needs to be uh, no roaming cost. Everybody needs to go and charge his car where he wants to. Also, I also mentioned this in the KPIs, of course. Uh, yeah, we'll brief about the interoperability. I also mentioned this already, uh, but interoperability is the ability of vehicles and chargers, um, of vehicles, chargers and networks and management systems to interact with each other and manage data uh, on a standardized basis. 
Uh, so this, this makes sure that there's safety, there's compatibility, uh, compatibility, functionality, system reliability and availability between all these different actors in the, in the chain. So now about the main, uh, the main topic, uh, city planning. When thinking of city planning for recharging infrastructure, uh, I want to take, take to a real uh, simple example. So imagine that an EV driver comes to city hall and asks, uh, um, uh, tells you, I have an EV now, but I don't have recharging infrastructure. Can you help me? The first option would be at the private recharging at their own premise. If that's not an, if that's not a possibility, that would be great because uh, that's the easiest. That's the easiest because it won't take up any public space and it won't cost you any money as an uh, authority. Then the second option is sort of a half-half, either have uh, private parking at a public area or uh, uh, a private uh, public recharging at a public area. And the last option is public recharging. There's different influence in every level. So with public recharging, the authority is completely in, in control. It can set all the rules, um, but it takes up public space. And now get back to examples on this later, but this is real simple uh, what you're thinking of. This is more, uh, it's more difficult than that, to be honest, because there are uh, a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, and these factors I've tried to, to image here in different layers. So the first layer might be that you look at charges that are already in place. So you look around the city, where are already recharging points? Then you go to the next layer, um, the current capacity of those recharging points. You can see, well, uh, you say uh, this EV driver tells me that I uh, that he needs recharging at a certain point, but there are already are rechargers uh, and they have availability, so it's not needed. Um, then you look at the new requests from inhabitants or companies. So um, what's going to future be like in that area? And so you have all these different layers that are important to determine uh, where recharging infrastructure is needed. Um, a really important one, actually, I didn't mention yet, is, is, the, is the grid, for instance, uh, but I, I will talk that about the, a little bit later. Also, social economic uh, uh, research is, is important, but it's not one thing, it's everything together that makes uh, a choice of recharging infrastructure. It's, it's not only about the data, though, so you can have these, these beautiful maps in your research, but it's always important in the end to go to the location and to check whether a certain location that you identified is actually suited. Um, yeah, if we'll, I will talk about this a little bit later, so I'll skip this for now. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about this, the um, work with the utility company. So it's really important, um, as probably everyone knows, uh, to work with uh, the grid company, the utility company. The grid is gonna see a lot more strain in the next three years uh, all around the world with upcoming EVs, uh, upcoming uh, renewable energy. Um, so it's really important to work with them. On the map on the right-hand side, I'm not sure if you can see, um, there are a couple of red dots uh, and they, because there the capacity on the grid is really low and there are green dots where the capacity is still sufficient. So this is a really important one to, uh, to invest in, uh, to your connection with the utility company because it can save you a lot of cost. I will go come back to the cost in the, in the in a bit, um, but it's really important. And I think everybody understands that. Uh, and it's important in the future uh, as well, uh, more because uh, the, um, the simple truth is that on the right top corner, you see the, the flow basically of the energy usage through the day. So in the morning, you have a peak and in the evening, you have a peak. And it can differ per location, but generally this is the case in, uh, in every country. Um, and you see that the evening peak will be higher and the morning peak will be higher with uh, charging of electric vehicles. There are new technologies that can take this away, but uh, those are not implemented everywhere and it's really difficult to manage. Um, so it's really important to make sure that if you have a room on a, on, a, on a grid at a certain location that you install recharging infrastructure there. Of course, again, assuming that this is just one of the layers uh, and all the layers needs to, needs to be combined, but this is a really important layer. Yeah, real brief about business opportunities. So it's important to create business opportunities um, for EV charging. Making sure that there, for instance, are city hubs 
uh, where different types of vehicles can charge. So you have a higher utilization rate of the charging location. Um, that means that it's easier for market players also to get into the market and make sure that not all the costs uh, fall on the uh, um, uh, fall on the user or on the city. It is important though when uh, putting market players into uh, into recharging that the data remains available for a city. Um, when a private company moves into this market, it of course going to want to handle the data. Uh, because the data, uh, of course, nowadays is just worth money on its own already, but they can map the entire need of recharging. For instance, you see here the unique users per charging point or um, the unique users yearly for a charging point or in a city. Um, you can see what's needed in the market. And if uh, the private company has access to this, but the city doesn't, that means that there's a power shift. Uh, and as a city, you want to remain in control. So it's really, really important to keep a hold of this data. And these are just examples uh, of the data that you can, uh, you can extract, but there's much, much more you can. Uh, and this is about, the, uh, uh, I mentioned to come back to this, about the cost of the electricity network. Um, so it's really, really expensive to, um, to increase the electricity network. It's gonna be needed uh, all around the world because uh, energy usage with uh, more sustainability is going up, that's for sure. Um, but if you can decrease it by a little bit, it will save you a lot of money already. Um, so you don't only need a grid connection, but then you need a transformer and a power cabinet and then a charging point. And at every step, uh, there needs to be civil work. So you need to dig, you need to put energy cables in the ground and you need to buy the, the transformer house uh, and buy the power cabinet. It needs to be serviced, it needs to be maintenance. Um, so it's really important, again, to work with the utility company. Then um, oh, there's uh, one slide missing, but this is this is about uh, city planning. And then uh, what I just talked about in the previous slides about city planning is really about the mapping, about looking for the right locations. Now I'm going a little bit more into the policies you can uh, you can extract or you can use to extract the best utilization for your network uh, and increase EV usage. So this is about uh, a lot about the occupancy rate of public recharges, or better said, maybe the utilization rate. And with that, I mean uh, the actual time that a vehicle is charging at a recharging point. So if a electric vehicle is parked at a recharger for 24 hours, but it's only charging for 10 hours, then the utilization rate or the occupancy rate is only 10. Because the other part of the time it's parked there, the other 14 hours, it's not needed for it to be at a recharging location. It can also be at a normal parking spot. And it's really important to keep, mind on this, keep this in mind and to keep it, um, if you incentivize this right and you increase the occupancy rate, you reduce the use of public space, reduce the insula installation and maintenance costs and reduce the investment cost, simply because you're reducing the amount of chargers needed. There are two main policy streams that can be uh, used to get this is first is restricting the use of EV enabled parking lots by non EVs. So banning um, uh, motorbikes or trikes that run on petrol on an EV spot. Uh, and another one is to is different parking rates for the EV enabled parking spots. So the first uh, direction of policy is restricting the use of EV enabled parking lots by non EVs. And there are three main streams that you can go by here. So first is to um, really only let vehicles use a parking spot while they are recharging. Uh, the image there that you see on the left uh, left hand side uh, is actually from a colleague of mine um, in front of his house. It says, uh, a banner says, uh, you can only park here uh, to charge if your car is fully charged between eight in the morning and 10 at night, you have to remove your car. And you can actually get a fine if you don't remove the car because you're not allowed to park then. The second option is to have only uh, parking, parking only for EVs, uh, but it's not mandatory to move your car if, um, if it's full. So that picture in the middle is actually in, from, in front of my house. I don't have uh, a private driveway, so I need to recharge in public, uh, but it's not mandatory to move the car. Uh, and if I look outside right now, I can see the car that's parked there for five days already, uh, blocking recharging for any other vehicle, uh, but still being parked there legally. And the last one is uh, parking for non-EVs. Um, also allowed on EV parking lots, 
but only in certain situations. Um, and you can see that these different uh, parking policies have different outcomes and they can be used to different uh, extents, of course. Um, if you want to uh, encourage EVs, then you want to make it as easy, as easy for them as possible, then the middle option might be the best. So they can park uh, on the EV parking spots uh, whenever uh, and they can charge if they want, but they don't have to charge. If you think, well, the recharging infrastructure is not really that great and we need to have a high utilization, uh, then the option on the left it might be the best because then uh, all the EVs can use the recharging infrastructure available. The second policy stream here is um, different parking rates for EV enabled parking lots. Um, so again, there are three different uh, bus, uh, I think not all is readable here, but I'll explain. Um, so you have free parking, regular parking and progressive parking rates. Free parking, uh, title says it, um, you don't have to pay for your parking there. Uh, regular parking rates, you have to pay. And with progressive parking rates, you pay more uh, uh, all along your uh, park for a longer period of time. Again, this can be used for different ends. So if you want to encourage and incentivize EVs, free parking is the way to go because people well, see that they see a, a monetary benefit there, so they won't, um, so they will buy an EV sooner uh, than when they have to pay more with an ICE. If you want to utilize your recharging infrastructure better, then progressive parking rates might be good. If somebody is parked at a at a spot, uh, recharging, uh, and after five hours his car is full or his vehicle is full, uh, and he needs to move. Um, but there's no no man, no fine in, in place, then he won't do it properly. But if there's progressive parking rate, so if he starts to pay more every hour after that, then probably he's gonna move his car. Uh, and this is an example uh, of how this is uh, put in place actually in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. So really in the beginning, in 2012 and 13, uh, there weren't that many EVs yet, and the city wanted to incentivize the EV ownership. Uh, and along the canals and in, in Amsterdam, there's really, really little parking space available. But it said to EV owners, well, if you buy an EV, and then you can have, can have a designated parking spot for yourself with a recharging point in front of your door. Uh, that was a huge incentive. So people that could afford it uh, back then, uh, because it was really expensive still, of course, um, they bought an EV because they could have their own private parking spot in front of their door. It was, it was amazing. That took off. Uh, and too many places got, uh, got personalized, so to say. So they moved it to only free parking. So you don't have your own designated parking spot, but you have free parking. So still incentivizing EVs, um, but not to the extent that you get a free parking spot. Now that has moved away as well because their EVs kept increasing and uh, uh, the regular parking was, was introduced for EVs as well. Uh, and you see now already that progressive parking is, is being talked about in some areas in Amsterdam to keep electric vehicles moving away from recharging points when they're full. Um, and there's one downside that I have to mention, I didn't mention before, to, to incentivizing EVs, because um, in the beginning, if there's a couple of EVs, nobody would bother. Um, but there are a lot of examples actually where uh, non-EV drivers get really frustrated or annoyed uh, when EVs get all these benefits. So if there's free parking and an ICE vehicle is not allowed there, it is, um, they, they, they might get frustrated and there are examples, it actually has a name, it's being ICED, um, where vehicles just block EV parking spaces uh, at the risk of a fine, but just, just out of frustration. So acceptance is really important here. Uh, so you need to balance it out because of course you want to incentivize EVs. Uh, then about innovation and trends. So there are two big innovations that I want to talk about. The first one is smart charging. Again, I have the same, same image, here, image here. So you have the, the flow of energy used throughout the day. Uh, and you see that the evening peak is being extended with the uh, charging of electric vehicles. It is possible to sh shift that charge um, over the day. So the graphs on the bottom uh, are actually analyses we did for, uh, for a company uh, at their office. And so they have all these um, EVs there recharging. And you can see that the red line is their contract. Uh, so the amount of uh, electricity that they have in their contract that they can use, but it's, it's overshoots quite large actually. Um, through technology, through smart charging, you can spread out the charging over a longer period of time. 
And if you do so, it makes sure that you won't go over, you overshoot your, your contract, so you won't pay more. Um, and it's easier on the grid. So it's good for um, stabilizing the grid. And the next one goes a little bit further. It has to do with smart charging as well, but it's vehicle to grid. So that basically means the name says it, you recharge also, you recharge your car or your other vehicle. Um, and when needed, when the grid asks for it and you have sufficient charge in your vehicle, you can deliver power back to the grid to stabilize it. And this is especially important with the, uh, the rise of renewable energies, uh, because yeah, as simply said, uh, if sun shines during the day, you can take energy from that. Uh, but at night or in the evening, there's less sun available, so you won't have as, money, as much, much energy. Well, you see the uh, power demand throughout the day. In the evening, there won't be as much sun, but there's a high demand for energy. During the day, there's a low amount of uh, demand for energy, but there is a lot of energy available. So it's a perfect solution that vehicles can charge fully during the day. They won't need their full charge in the evening, so they can deliver some power back to the grid, stabilize the grid, uh, and make use of fossil, fossil energy um, redundant. Uh, the last slide, um, and this is a real important takeaway, I think, is the public procurement is a powerful tool. So I, managed, uh, I mentioned that uh, it's important to get market players into recharging because uh, you don't want all the costs to fall on the city or on private people on their home premise. Um, but the the danger with that is that um, the market players will become king. So they won't have, they'll have a proprietary system, they will get a monopoly, uh, maybe they won't work together. But with, through public procurement, cities can uh, mandate interoperability, a seamless charging experience, and a positive business case for electro mobility, also for the EV user. It's really important. So not only for the companies for the recharge for recharging, but also for the EV user. So these are the KPIs I discussed earlier. And it can be that through public procurement, cities can mandate this. Thank you for your attention. This was my presentation. Uh, I hope you uh, uh, took away something from it. If you have any questions, uh, please ask. Okay, thank you very much for an informative and insightful presentation. Uh, we think that there are lots of valuable information and experiences we can apply to promote the charging infrastructure for EVs in Vietnam. The step, the strategies, and the way to cooperate with enterprises for city planning on charging infrastructures are also necessary for cities in Vietnam like Hanoi. And also the incentives for EVs are uh, what the city trying to state to include in the regulation to encourage people to use EV instead of conventional vehicle. So I think that the, the presentation will really valuable for the cities in this situation. And uh, now I think that uh, we have some questions from the audience. Xin cảm ơn ông Sartre đã có một cái bài trình bày về rất là nhiều nội dung liên quan đến phương tiện chạy điện. Trước khi uh, chuyển sang uh, phần uh, hỏi đáp, thì uh, tôi xin phép được tóm tắt một số cái thông tin chính của bài trình bày của ông Sanchez. Mr. Sanchez, I would like to briefly summarize your presentation in Vietnamese for Vietnamese audience before we uh, welcome the questions from the audience. Trong phần trình bày của mình thì uh, Ông Sancha đã chia sẻ về tầm quan trọng của các cơ sở hạ tầng xe điện, à, cơ sở hạ tầng sạc có thể là sạc à, di động và các cái à, loại hình kinh doanh có liên quan ạ. Về à, các cái yếu tố quan trọng nhất trong việc đánh giá các cái cơ sở hạ tầng sạc điện như là sạc điện mạch, sạc chéo hay là các cái vấn đề liên quan đến việc thanh toán các cái cơ sở ở, ở hạ tầng liên quan đến sạc điện ạ phân loại về các cái địa điểm dành cho các cái chạm sạc xe điện có thể là cái địa điểm ở trên xa lộ ở nhà hoặc là các cái khu sinh hoạt chung ạ đối với một số cái lưu ý thì ông có đưa ra đây là các cái phương tiện thì không phải là tất cả các phương tiện đều có thể sử dụng chung một cái cơ sở hạ tầng chạm sạc được vì có những cái yêu cầu về kỹ thuật riêng 
Ví dụ như là nếu như là sạc ở nhà chẳng hạn thì cái khoảng cách lái xe có thể là ngắn rồi còn nếu như là sạc ở gì sạc ở trên đường hay là sạc ở các cái địa điểm nằm giữa cái lộ trình của chúng ta thì đều có những cái đặc tính riêng về các cái tiêu chuẩn thì có các cái giải pháp khác nhau liên quan đến các cái loại xe khác nhau ví dụ có chúng ta có các cái loại chạm sạc như là sạc à, à, tiêu chuẩn như chúng ta sẽ sạc qua đêm thì chúng ta sẽ có thể à, tính phí tại cái chạm sạc đó ở điểm dừng đó hay là chúng ta sạc à, trên cái lộ trình mà chúng ta đang đi tức là sạc nhanh ạ đấy nó có có những cái yêu cầu khác nhau Đồng thời ông Sancho cũng đưa ra uh, các cái tiêu chuẩn hóa cho cái khả năng tương tác và cạnh tranh đối với cái việc xây dựng chạm sạc ạ. Các cách tiếp cận phân lớp để lên, lên cái kế hoạch từ phía thành phố để xây dựng các cái chạm sạc ạ. Dung lượng các điện, uh, các cái chạm sạc này như thế nào, uh, yêu cầu từ phía cư dân hoặc là các cái công ty về lưới điện hay là về vị trí, đây là những cái yếu tố mà cần cân nhắc ạ. Ngoài ra thì ông Hân Trang cũng đưa ra một số cái khuyến nghị liên quan đến việc là thành phố có thể đưa ra những cái chính sách như thế nào để có thể khuyến khích cái việc sử dụng xe điện thay cho các cái phương tiện truyền thống. Thì đây là một số cái điểm nổi bật trong cái phần trình bày của ông Phan Tra mà xin phép được tóm lược ạ. Bây giờ thì chúng ta sẽ chuyển sang phần hỏi và đáp. À, nếu như các anh chị có câu hỏi nào thì có thể cho lên phần chat box để chúng ta có thể trao đổi với diễn giả. Ở đây thì tôi đã à, nhìn thấy một câu hỏi rồi ạ. Then Mr. Phan Tra, we have one question from the audience relating to the Uh, the electricity price for charging. Yes. Is there any difference in the electricity price for charging uh, the, for the EVs and the price for electricity for normal use for commerce for industrial electricity? Is there any so difference? So the difference between the price for electricity for recharging or for normal electric use? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that depends on the on the situation, of course. Uh, but I say there's no there's no difference. Um, what I know from uh, analysis we did in the Netherlands, um, you can see that actually when you need recharging for an electric vehicle, or at least when you need large parking lots with a lot of different recharging, you need to have a larger grid connection. Uh, that actually makes the price of your electricity go down. But of course, you need a lot of investment cost. Um, but in general. Uh, the, the cheapest way for recharging is at your home premise um, because there you have uh, the least uh, amount of investment. Yes. Thank you. Nhiều Sa Cha có chia sẻ. Thank you for your answers. I uh, need to translate to the young. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Nhiều Sa Cha có chia sẻ thì uh, cái um, giá điện thì không có sự thay đổi ạ. Tuy nhiên thì cái giá điện này lại còn liên quan đến việc là nếu như chúng ta có sử dụng chạm sạc ở bên ngoài ạ, thì cái chi phí đầu tư cho cái chạm sạc ấy khá là lớn. Có thể là giá điện khi mà chúng ta uh, lại còn phụ thuộc vào các quốc gia ạ. Như ở Việt Nam mình thì chúng ta sử dụng điện nhiều thì sẽ tăng lên hình như ở bên các bạn ấy thì uh, giá điện thì lại sử dụng nhiều thì lại, lại bớt đi đúng không ạ? Và bình thường thì thông thường thì cái việc sử dụng cái sạc này thì lại sử dụng ở nhà cho nên là cái chi phí điện này thì không có sự thay đổi nếu chúng ta sử dụng các cái chạm sạc à, các cái 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 sạc ở gia đình ạ. Uh, one more question also related to the electricity price. If there is an hourly electricity tariff, for example, in the peak hour or in the off peak hour or normal hour, is there any difference in the electricity price? A difference in the electricity price between the peak hours and the, the lower hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there can be. There can absolutely be a difference in price. Uh, and the, the innovation I talked about with smart charging uh, is actually interesting for this. You can You can program it so that your car or your bus or your truck will charge uh, when the price is lower and um, so that's really interesting and that's also what the uh, the grid company would want because uh, if the price is higher that means that there's a 
lot of usage of the grid. It uh, means that the grid quality will go down uh, or stability will go down if you use also electricity at that moment. So they want to have it spread out as evenly as possible. Thank you for your answers. Uh, như ông San uh, chia sẻ thì uh, có sự thay đổi, có sự khác biệt khi mà chúng ta sử dụng uh, cái chạm sạc vào những cái giờ cao điểm hoặc là giờ ngoài giờ cao điểm. Thì ở đây thì có nhắc tới cái uh, chạm sạc thông minh. Với cái chạm sạc thông minh này thì chúng ta sẽ có thể là sạc phương tiện uh, vào cái giờ không cao điểm thì có thể sẽ cái chi phí nó sẽ không bị tăng lên ạ. Dạ, không biết là anh uh, Yến có câu hỏi nào không ạ? Có câu hỏi nào không hay là có um, hài lòng với câu trả lời từ ông Sancha ạ? Yes, I think yeah, we have one more questions from the audience. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about open communication protocols and what are the policies enable for ensuring that such open standards and protocol are put in place. Yeah, yeah, that's not a question indeed in the in the in the chat as well. Okay, yeah. uh, it's a it's a it's a really good question. Uh, and thanks for that. Um, and I jumped over the open protocols pretty quick, also due to the time difference, uh, the time uh, limitations. Um, not a difference. Um, so the open communication protocols are really important. I hope we got that across. Um, And what you see, for instance, in the in the EU, because that's the examples that I know best, is that there are protocols that are being mandated uh, by regulation, actually. Um, but it's really tricky to do this because uh, you don't want to mandate it too soon and to evict basically other users that don't have this protocol already yet uh, out of the market, because then you can also have a, a competition lockout or a, um, a consumer lock-in because there's there might only be one party that has this protocol already. Um, so it's, it's a really tricky enabler, uh, uh, absolutely right. And good question, therefore. Um, I'd say that the, the way to go is to, to, to work together with the market, but to set one standard uh, of, of usage uh, and set a pathway to this. So that you, you um, basically tell the market, we're going to implement this in a certain amount of years, uh, and then you can keep, keep control while keeping the market Uh, satisfied, so to say. I hope that satisfied is uh, as an answer uh, at this stage, but it's a really difficult, uh, difficult uh, topic and a good question. Yes, thank you. I think that we can uh, understand your answers. And we have one more question for you. The charging technologies change frequently. So if we invest on this kind of technology, charging technologies today, It may soon be uh, outdated. So, how will how the country, the developing country, deal with this problem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, a good question. Yeah, how to, so the question is how to to manage that your recharging infrastructure won't get outdated in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's that's an interesting one. But uh, I would have a return question also. Um, like what is the, what is the right moment to, to enter uh, a market? You never know when uh, technology reaches a, a certain threshold uh, that is usable for tens of years. Um, so you don't know if, if there might be an innovation in five years uh, that makes all the other recharging infrastructure obsolete and the entire world needs to go to uh, new charging stations. Um, so you never know what the right moment is. Uh, I would say that the recharging infrastructure has matured in such a way that it's unlikely that such a um, real big shift will happen soon. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that, that if you're investing in recharging infrastructure, um, that's already, uh, that's not the newest anymore, then it will be outdated sooner than the, uh, the, the newest recharging infrastructure. Uh, but keep in mind that, of course, it's going to be more expensive. Um, So it's, it's a difficult one to manage. And then, yeah, nobody has a crystal ball uh, to see what's going to happen. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Uh, như ông Phan Tha chia sẻ thì uh, cái công nghệ này thì nó có thể thay đổi 5 năm hoặc là 10 năm thì cũng uh, chúng ta cũng không thể biết trước được. Và hiện tại thì các quốc gia cũng chưa có cái 
cái phương án nào tốt nhất cho cái việc xử lý cái việc à, cái công nghệ nó có thể lạc hậu một cách quá nhanh ạ à? 